Hello and welcome to the June webinar from the Clean Coal Centre. My name is Leslie Sloss and I'm a consultant. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, www.iea-coal.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download our reports at no charge after a one-hour registration. Please visit the website for details. My webinar today is on enhanced coal bed methane recovery. The report has been out for review and will be published very shortly indeed. If you have any questions during the talk, please use the Ask the Question box, which is at the, at the top of your screen there. Um, add your email address as well, and then if I have any issues in answering your question, I can do so later, and I do promise to get back to you. This will be a relatively short presentation on a relatively short report. It was requested that we produce a simple overview of the potential for enhanced coal bed methane recovery. The Clean Coal Centre has produced numerous reports on coal bed methane itself, um, on production, uses, and so on, and these can be downloaded free of charge from the website. Our sister organisation, the Greenhouse Gas Programme, has also produced extensive reports on CO2 enhanced coal bed methane, focusing mainly on the CO2 capture side of things. This report, however, looks at the injection of all potential gases, including raw flue gases, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and so on, looking at the economics and the feasibilities of the technologies involved. This diagram shows a standard coal bed methane well, a single borehole which is drilled down into a deep coal seam uh, to release the methane which is trapped there. The methane builds up during the coalification process, and if a coal is deep enough or situated under non permeable rock, rock, then the gas remains there and can build up into relatively high concentrations as a valuable resource. And we can use this methane as natural gas for large and small scale power generation on and off site. We can use it as a zin gas for motor fuels or for um, other chemicals. And of course, if the gas is pure enough and clean enough, we can actually put it straight into a natural gas pipeline, which is great for en energy supply and demand on a local and broader basis. Even dilute methane can be used. In a previous report we did, we showed that ventilation gas streams from closed mines such as the Vales Point mine in Australia um, methane concentrations below 3%, even below 1%, can actually be fired in gen back in engines, produce a little bit of power, but more importantly, reduce the global warming potential of that potentially leaking methane. So we know that coal bed methane is well established as a technology. And if you go on Google, which I do regularly, and just Google something like coal bed methane as a fuel supply source, you will come across something like this, which I got from CBM Asia. It just shows the sheer volume of methane that's out there in coal seams and how much is being used in a worldwide basis. The major producers are the USA and Australia, with Asia catching up. These are fully mature technologies being run by some of the biggest companies in the world. We're looking about Shell and BHP, Conoco and so on. These are not small players. These are big profit-making companies making money out of a well-established technology. But Coal bed methane could be more efficient. Down at the bottom there on the left, we see the average development production curve from a coal bed methane well. We start drilling. We will see, in most cases, water coming up as it's trapped down in the coal seam. And as we pump out the water, the gas starts to flow from within the coal bed seam up through our bore well under pressure, and we're producing this free gas relatively simply. Now, it's like a Coca-Cola bottle. You take the lid off the top and you'll get this sudden rush of um, gas coming out the top there very easily. However, this pressure will drop over time and the methane production rate will go down. What we want to do is what's happening with the little chaps on the right there, is to keep that from dropping off, pick up the tail end of that curve and get as much of the methane out as we possibly can. In most cases, most coal bed seams will only release up to about 50% of the methane that's actually present. And we want to get that up to 90%, as that is a valuable source and something we want to get. This is a flow diagram of how you would consider moving from a coal bed methane project into an enhanced coal bed methane site. So what you would do is look at your production of, coal bed, of methane, 
Is it still economic or is it starting to deplete, as shown in the right there? If so, is there a potential to maybe stick such a gas as CO2 or uh, nitrogen or a flue gas down there to chase out that extra methane and perhaps even store the CO2 down there? And that is the main crux of ECBM over CBM, is the fact that you're injecting a gas down there, which we hope includes a lot of CO2, and that acts as carbon capture and storage. So not only are we producing a lot more methane, which we can sell, we're actually disposing of CO2, and that is a win-win situation. If we don't have CO2, we can use other um, gases, but obviously the CO2 potential comes down and the sort of zing factor for, for helping in the global warming potential uh, is cut significantly. So what the report does is looks at the principles of enhanced coal bed methane production, looks at the economics, and then goes through the case studies that are out there. I believe that I have listed all the case study has uh, been performed, but I'm happy to be corrected if I've missed any out. So in standard coal bed methane production, we're drilling down um, into um, the well and we're moving the gas that is trapped on the surface of the coal particle. Now that gas is trapped by the pressure of the water and the pressure of, of the other gas that's still within the gas seam. As soon as we release that pressure by drilling in, then methane is going to flood out from the gaps where it's been sitting, but it's also going to diffuse and desorb from the surface of the coal itself. What happens when you inject a gas down there is there's actually competition for the absorption site on top of the coal. So if you flush a gas down into a coal bed methane seam, you will chase out any gas that's sitting there just by a flushing effect. But you will also encourage in composition for this, these absorption sites and the coal molecules within the seam. Now nitrogen is quite good at competing for methane, it will chase a bit of it all away and it will take up the sorption sites on the coal surface, but CO2 is twice as good. For every methane molecule it kicks off that coal, two, um, up to two carbon dioxide molecules can stick on instead, and this is where it's very exciting in terms of carbon capture and storage potential. This is... Um, what shows the movement of the gases through the coal seam. So if you look in the far right there, we have the well bore. That's the big thick pipe where the gases are flowing up to the surface where we're going to send it off into our, our gas supply system. Now, most of the gas is flushing out through these big fractures in the seam. That's actual gaps between the coal. Um, these are fractures that have been caused either by the drilling process itself or are naturally there within the coal seam. Moving and feeding into those gaps in the seam are the, the smaller gaps, the meso and the micropores. And the movement of gas is more to do with absorption, diffusion, and Darcy flow, different levels and different types of flow rates. But what happens is as flush, gas is flushed out of the bigger um, seams, then you increase the release from, through the desorption and diffusion processes. And as you chase a gas down there, it will compete, as we say, in the surface of the coal chase off the methane and hopefully stick there itself instead. Unfortunately, what we see happening in the micro and mesopore scale is that the attachment of the CO2 to the surface of the coal, because it's taking up more space, it's actually causing swelling of the coal. In some cases, a 7 to 8 percent change in actual physical size of the coal particles in the surface. So what we see is the closing up of the micro and the mesopores, and in many cases, actually, the closing of the fractures. That means the sealing up of the whole flow system. And so in many cases, what the, the problem they've hit is when they inject CO2, then everything expands and seals up. They can no longer inject because there's nothing to inject it into. The gaps have gone. And obviously, the production decreases as well as there's no gaps of the, the, the methane to flow back out. And so the hard truth is that, yes, CO2 does stick, stick beautifully within um, the, the coal seam that we're injecting it down into, but the coal swelling shuts off the movement of gas after a certain period of time. Now, what um, projects have tried to do is counteract this by staging the injection process. One of the easiest ways is through a huff and puff project. That means you simply inject some gas down, stop, let some gas come out, and repeat that process in the hope that you'll kind of chase away the gas that's down there and cause a minimal amount of swelling because you're doing it in a phased manner. A more sensible approach, perhaps, is this one shown up here, where initially you're going to use nitrogen as your um, injection 
fuel uh, gas because we know that it's not going to cause as much coal swelling and we can chase as much of the methane as we can out without any issues to start with. And we will do that until we get some breakthrough of nitrogen at the production well, which shows that it's not adhering anymore. We can then kind of phase that in, put CO2 injection in, and we'll keep doing that until either the CO2 starts to break through because there's so much down there, or until we hit the swelling and injectivity problem. So let's say we go ahead and we decide we're going to do this. Um, how are we going to select our site? Well, ideally, we want to use a site that's already being used for coal bed methane production because half of our work is already done for us. The site's set up. We have an injection well. We've been through the planning with permission process. The public are on board. We have staff. Everything's ready to roll. We even have a market. If we don't have that, then we're looking to move into unminable coal seams. Why do we want unminable coal seams? Well, we want to be using a mine and coal that we're not necessarily going to want later on. Probably something that's a lot deeper, so it'll have more methane, and something that's harder to get to if you want to dig out the coal itself. It's more suitable for sticking something down than taking something out. However, the definition of unminable varies because what used to be unminable in the past is obviously not necessarily unminable now due to developments in technology and drilling processes. So although we can see in this table here many organisations have tried to define what is unminable in terms of, usually in terms of depth, there's disagreement over what is regarded as unminable from one place to the other. But perhaps the most important reason we want to use unminable seams is the fact that we're sticking CO2 down there and we want it to stay down there forever. So we don't want anything that anyone's going to wander across in 50 years' time and say, ooh, let's just dig up that coal, because that will undo all our hard work. So let's look at the economics. Pros, especially if we have a coal bed methane site in place, then a lot of our work is already done for us. It's been evaluated in terms of production. We have our market. And there's also the kick that we may actually be paid to take this CO2 away. Somebody has it. They have to get rid of it, and in future we will see CO2 markets hopefully becoming a lot stronger than they are now. So what we're looking for is more saleable methane into an already established market and CO2 disposal that we're making money for. This is win-win. There's no question why people have been looking at this as it's very, very exciting. And all we need to do is take our existing um, production well on the right there and add this in new induction, uh, injection well, which is either carbon dioxide or nitrogen, to go down there into the well itself. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy, or so it should be. Unfortunately, nothing is ever that simple. We're looking at installing, yes, a new gas injection system. It also needs to be compressed gas. And if we're looking for CO2 injection, it has to be processed gas. And this is the crux, and this is the expense. Um, of all the projects carried out so far, it's been suggested that the input parameter with the greatest effect on the economic viability of the overall project is the cost of that CO2 separation from the flue gas. The current cost of CO2 processing has been put at around $42 per tonne. It could go down to as low as $20 per tonne, but that's an awful lot of money to spend on processing a gas that you're going to be sticking underground. So unless somebody's going to be paying you to do it, it's simply not going to be worth your while. You're not going to get the feedback in terms of production of methane and sales of methane. So what they've concluded word for word is injection of CO2 in into an unminable coal seam would most likely never be profitable without some additional economic driver being present. That's some sort of UN uh, FCC um, uh, market mechanism in place, some carbon price. So um, because of this, the greatest cost in this coal bed methane, as I say, is the gas processing. And this is a statement I've just said. Sorry, I should have moved on to that slide. What about raw flue gases? Let's say we don't bother processing that CO2 out. Let's just say we stick literally a raw flue gas. We take that from the flue or the stack of a coal fired power plant. We pressurize it and we use that to inject into the well. Yes, it's doable, but we're not going to get any of the credits for CO2 because the amount of CO2 in that flue gas is going to be five, four, five percent. So it's, you're not going to get the, the, the money that you would get for CO2 storage, and you're not going to get the kudos that you get for CO2 storage. You're simply producing more methane, and at the moment, coal bed methane is not limited necessarily in its availability. 
So moving on to the case studies, I have gone through literally all the published reports and all the reviews, region by region. The majority of work has taken place in the USA, although significant work has also taken place in Japan and Poland. Despite all of these pilot projects having taken place, over 10 of them, all of them have stalled. And in fact, most of them have effectively died completely. The only country that I can see still muttering about the potential for ECBM is China, where most, that's the Ministry of Science and Technology, are currently working on a proposal for the Queen Shui Basin. However, the economics of the process uh, project appears to hinge almost entirely on income in the form of CO2 credits under the Kyoto Green Development Mechanism. So unless they get that money to take the CO2 away, the project is not economically viable. So if you look at the report, it will go through each of those projects in detail. So let's just quickly run through them. ARC is the Alberta Research Council project, which had over 20 industry and government investors, and it injected over 200 tonnes of CO2 in the first phase. It even went as far to source uh, potential gas, including landfill gas, ethanol plants, acid gas plants, and coal-fired power plants. So it was genuinely looking at taking um, waste gas streams and injecting them down into this uh, big then Big Valley site. Um, the project was then renamed CSEMP, which is the CO2 storage and enhanced methane production test, and they had two pilot tests at around 10,000 tonnes of CO2. However, it kind of fizzled out, and as far as I can see, this happened when ARC became a more commercial body called Arberta Innovations, and it currently seems to be focusing entirely on oil sands in the region. Presumably, this is more technically and economically viable for them. Um, so it was presumably an economic decision. Moving down to the USA, we have CCARB, which is the Southeast Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership, um, which had a project for CO2 storage in the Appalachian Basin. Now, this could be huge. They could increase methane production in that region by 70 billion meters cubes, and it could hold over 1.3 billion tons of CO2. So this could be a major thing in terms of uh, proving ECBM potential. And the Allison project there was the first ECBM project in the world, and it was very effective. Um, it got 95% of that methane out. We heard that most um, CBM sites only get 50%. Allison got up to 95%. However, it hit that genuine CO2 swelling issue where they just couldn't inject anything anymore and everything seized up due to the coal swelling. The Tankery project next door was also successful, um, enhancing methane production there while storing 91 tonnes of CO2. But that had technical issues with equipment breaking down and so on, and it just kind of fizzled to a halt. Similar projects in the Plains, CO2 Reduction Partnership in Burke County, North Dakota, Pump Canyon, New Mexico, console work in Pittsburgh and Upper Preport have also had issues, some with equipment and others with that CO2 breakthrough or the CO2 swelling. The Pump Canyon project uh, was considered as the most successful ECBM project in the world in terms of volume as it stored over 160,000 tonnes of CO2 in, in one year alone between 2008 and 2009. Over in China, the APP, that's the Asia-Pacific Partnership, have been working with the China United Coal Bed Methane Corporation and CSIO in Australia, as well as JCO in Japan, and looking at various blocks, including the Luilin Gas Plot in Shaanxi Province, and succeeded in injecting over 460 tonnes of CO2 there. That was quite an academic project, so if you want to look at the technical feasibility of injection of gases, it's a good one to look at, as it used a tracer gas to follow the potential leakage and movement of gas within the seam. So they got a good bit of information on the fluid dynamics and also on the potential leakage into local aquifers and so on. They, they proved, proved, proved at that stage that it wasn't an issue at that particular site, but of course it may be an issue on a site-by-site -site basis. Um, China have also worked with Canada in this Queen Shui Basin, and that's that um, project that hasn't quite died yet, that is still being considered by most. Um, the Japanese project at Yubari Seam on Hokkaido Island stored 884 tonnes of CO2 between 2004 and 2007. Again, swelling and permeability put the halt on that one. In India, there has been the talk for CBM, ECBM, and even underground coal gasification in the Gondwana Basin. A lot of blocks being offered for sale and sold, but at the moment there doesn't seem to be that much happening in practice, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on in future. 
In Australia, the Asia-Pacific Partnership did have a project plan for Australia based on the, the Yubari project in Japan, but this, like the others, has stalled. And it seems that one of the issues with the Australian coals is that although there is a huge coal bed methane potential down there, many of their seams are actually already semi-saturated with CO2, which is very unusual as most coal seams are saturated with water. But some of the Australian seams actually have CO2 down there already, which makes it more of a challenge in terms of, of replacing that CO2 with more CO2, obviously. Within Pol uh, Europe, Poland have completed their Recopol project uh, for CO2 storage in the Silesian Basin as part of the European Commission's fifth framework program. 760 tonnes of CO2 injection uh, completed there. Recopol then seems to have mutated into what's now called MOVE CBM, which is monitoring and evaluation of ECBM. Uh, that happened in 2006 and ran for two years. As far as I'm aware, it stalled somewhat because of the economics as shown in this graph. Basically, it was shown that if there was a high price um, for CO2 credits, so if you were being paid a lot of money to take the CO2 and dispose of it, and also a high price for the methane that you're producing, then it could be very economically uh, tempting. However, in the alternative situation where the CO2 price is low and the methane price is also low, then it simply wasn't going to work. And so at that stage, uh, the maths didn't, just didn't work out and they've kind of put it on ice for the moment. There is an awful lot of work happening in uh, CBM and UCG in that region, so there's certainly an awful lot of activity going on, but for the moment the ECBM side of things has certainly stalled. There were talks of projects in Turkey, Germany, in the Netherlands and the UK, which I mentioned briefly in the report, but again, none of these really got past the back of the envelope calculation stage. And so to conclude, theoretically and on paper, ECBM is huge win-win technology. I mean, it's a bit of a no-brainer. You get rid of CO2 and you get extra methane out. It, if it worked, it would be amazing. Unfortunately, in practice, it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, as well as technical issues, the coal swelling seems to be the real bugbear. That CO2, as it attaches, which you wanted to do, takes up too much space and the coal swells and everything seizes up. And that makes the economics challenging. And technology, more has to be invested to get around that, and that's a major hurdle which people seem to be sort of sitting back and waiting for somebody else to get through. And so, as far as we can see, all the projects have stalled or closed. But the only one still with a little bit of life left in it is that MOS project in China in Kunchu Basin, which hinges entirely on the CO2 credits. And so, we're kind of waiting to see if that happens. Perhaps in the future, a little bit of money is spent on this, a little bit of a, a technology leap in terms of um, technology for, for drilling an injection and some sort of chemical trick to get around the CO2 swelling would help. But for the moment, um, ECBM is a kind of, uh, let's just sit back and wait and let somebody else invest in it. Um, and I hope that makes it simple for you. A uh, bit of a, a rough and ready guide to it, but that's what I conclude at the moment. Um, this, it's not quite worth the investment. So thank you for listening. If you do have any questions, uh, they can pop on, on my question screen now. Please don't feel obliged to ask me a question. Hopefully my talk has been comprehensive enough that you've understood it fully. And I'm also exceptionally good at replying to emails. Um, so please do note down that email address and email me with any questions that you have. Um, for next month, uh, you can look forward to um, listening to the dulcet tones of Dr. Stephen Mills, who will be speaking to you on the 22nd of July on the prospects for coal and clean coal technologies in Italy. Uh, nice for the sunny weather, which we're having on this side of the planet, at least. All our webinars, including mine, are free from download um, with a quick click, either through the, uh, this website, Bright Talk, or through our own website. There will be a link there. Mine probably won't be available till tomorrow. Um, but they're all there and they're all free to download. You can tune in like a little podcast if you decide you want to come back and listen again. Um, as far as I can see, there are no questions. Obviously, I have made it as clear as a bell. Again, if you do want to email me, please do. I'm more than happy to reply. And the report should be free for download to our members uh, within the next day or so. Um, and um, free within the next six months to those who are not members. Thank you very much indeed for listening.